Hey guys, Liam Motley here, and today I've got a video breaking down the GPT-4.0 release, uh, the recent for the spring update from OpenAI. There's some good things and there's some bad things for the AI agency space. So I wanted to jump on here and give my thoughts, um, now that I've had a few days to stew it and really think about uh, what the implications are for us. So GPT-4.0, the good and the bad for AI agencies. Of course, what's new, if you've been living under a rock, we've had the OpenAI spring update recently, and they released a bunch of things, but mainly uh, the new flagship model GPT-4.0, um, O meaning Omni, and this is a step towards much more natural human and computer interaction, according to OpenAI on their blog post. So that's taking an input of text, audio, image, and video, and it's able to output in text, audio, and image. So massive new capabilities that we've kind of been cobbling together using different services. And we've had Whisper and we've had these other services that allow us to get this kind of functionality anyway, but they've just pulled it all into one and allowed the model to understand uh, not only text input, but also audio and video and stream it all into one input as well. So very exciting stuff. Um, I was hoping for GPT 4.5 or GPT 5, um, but as we'll see later in this video, there's some ramifications of what this incremental improvement might mean for the space, um, but I'll, I'll save that for a little later. So there's also other stuff of the new ChatGPT desktop app, which is cool. I've just been able to get it downloaded. I think I need to update my Mac, as uh, many of you guys will as well. I think it's only available for Mac uh, for the time being. Um, and GPT 4.0 is now available to free users, um, not just plus subscribers, and therefore the GPT store is open to over 100 million users. So if you guys are interested in uh, jumping on GPTs, I know I've made a video before that I think a lot of you found my channel through, a GPT store is now available to 100 million users or more, um, which is great, great news for you if you're hoping to be a GPT developer. Um, we have yet to see anything about the monetization of GPT, so I'd be Curious to see what they have in store for that, because that's kind of, they, they attracted us all, they honeypotted us into this GPTs uh, and building GPTs on the store, thinking it's going to be an app store moment and saying, yeah, monetization this, monetization that. Um, and we haven't seen seen anything of, at least I haven't seen anything about uh, about the GPT store monetization. So other stuff, I don't think it's that relevant for us as, as AI agency owners. Okay, I want to start off with the good points first, then we'll get onto the bad a little later. Um, here's Sam Altman counting up all the, all the money he's making from these recent updates. Um, Firstly, new modalities. It is a good advancement. We are getting a ton of new solution opportunities opening up for us as we're able to take in different types of inputs from our end users and then give them different types of outputs back. And uh, really, there's, there's, it's not a massive leap forward because we've been able to do this. One of the examples on screen that OpenAI has provided shows them asking a question and then providing an audio file as part of the input. And then it's able to answer questions and reason off the back of that as well. But prior to that, it's not. we were able to do that with transcription anyway. We just transcribe it and then put it into the give it to the model to, to reason over. So not a massive leap, we've been able to do a lot of these things, but really what it is is just a simplification of our workflow and of the systems we need to build for our clients. Um, less fiddling around with multiple different APIs, which is easier to get the results that we want for our clients. And I think this is great for many of you who are not so technically inclined. And I know a lot of you have been brought into this opportunity and still struggle with some of the technical parts of it, but it's a clear trend that we're seeing towards this simplification, but there's still a level of complexity of how can this actually be implemented into the business? So you're getting easier to do, uh, but you're still, you're getting more power essentially in your hands that you can provide to your clients as well. And because we're gonna be using fewer APIs, this is probably gonna decrease our costs as well because we're not having to use transcription and then generate an answer and then use text to speech if we're using these kind of systems, which we'll get onto next, which I think is pretty exciting. The voice AI systems and providers I think are gonna win big here um, because once audio inputs and outputs become available via the GPT-4.0 API, the response times can be reduced by up to 60% uh, based off the numbers that OpenAI has provided, which is between 200 and 300 milliseconds for responses. At least that's what we saw of the ChatGPT in the demo. And as you can see here on platforms like Vapi, uh, even on the fastest and lowest intelligence model, uh, We've got a 650 millisecond response time. And this is purely because they're having to stack up so many models that when your voice comes in over the phone, they have to transcribe that. Then they have to generate an answer in text. And then they need to turn that text into speech. And then they need to send that off to you as well. So uh, this 650 millisecond latency, which was fine, it was fast enough. We're now going to get a potentially 60% uh, reduction of that as well. So I think as soon as these guys are able to access VAPI and, and Bland, etc., cetera, are able to access GPT-4 over API and send and receive audio inputs and outputs, um, we could see a, a, a continued boom of the voice AI space, which is something I've been talking about a lot on the channel here. If you guys are just starting with your AI agency and are looking for a, a good place to start or specialize in, then voice AI is a great place to look into. Next, we have a quick win for us as AI agency owners, which is GPT-4.0 APIs being twice as fast and 50% cheaper 
than GPT-4 Turbo. It's always great on these big updates from OpenAI because we can kind of expect these reductions um, and it's good to see that they're continuing to do this over time so we can expect it in future. And an interesting thing to point out is that we're getting much closer to this GPT-3.5 Turbo cost, which is, is basically free. This thing is so cheap. It's, it's, it barely costs you a dime to do anything. Um, but here we can see that we've got input of $5 and 50 cents for GPT 3.5 Turbo. So it's just a 10x price difference considering the, the massive increase in intelligence and, and modalities that we're going to get from GPT 4.0. You can't not be happy with that outcome. Next, we have another quick win for us as AI agency owners, which might've slipped under the radar for you a little bit. Better language support for GPT 4.0 that can handle over 50 different languages now, covering 97% of the spoken world. And it's also going to decrease the token usage. As you can see here, the new tokenizers compression method is actually reducing the amount of tokens uh, for some of these languages, as you can see. Um, now this may not seem like a major, but this is a question I get all the time in my accelerator and on my free community Q and A's, which is, should I be selling local or should I be trying to sell in the US or should I be trying to sell in Europe? It's mainly people interested in selling in the US. Um, and my answer is always no, <laughs> ideally go local. Um, if, you're, if you're from South America and you're trying to go over to the United States and start selling there, you're at a natural disadvantage just by purely being outside of the country. You might sound a little different over the phone. Um, you might have a name that doesn't necessarily ring like you're, you could be someone's neighbor. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that, but it's just the, the cold hard facts of it's gonna be harder for you. You're playing at some kind of disadvantage or debuff versus someone who is, is John Smith who lives next door. You know, If you're in, for example, the Spanish speaking world, I'm sure you've already had fairly good responses and, and good translation capabilities from GPT, uh, but it's really the smaller areas and these smaller languages that up until now haven't really had the support. Now you can be the first person into those markets. So if you live somewhere that you thought, oh, no one's ever gonna be able to use this in my language, or I shouldn't bother selling local, now is your chance to be the first guy or first girl in that market to go and start selling these solutions. And you might say that, oh, but they don't, they're not interested in AI. Don't try to sell it as AI, then just sell it as a meaningful difference in their business. And now getting into the bad, and we may have the rise of e-girlfriends sooner or later, uh, but that's not what I wanna go into here. Um, it's actually the long road to integration that's the first thing that I'm kind of concerned about here. Um, and, and by that, what I mean is these new modalities and text and audio and video and image and all this stuff is cool, but it's, it, it doesn't mean anything to us as AI agency owners until we're able to get that to our end customer. With all these platforms that we use like make.com and Voiceflow um, and sending things to WhatsApp and, and the different solutions we build, they are lagging far behind the technology that OpenAI is providing. It really is an issue of trying to get the stuff in the hands and making it useful for our end users. Um, but until these platforms catch up and, and allow support for the customers can send voice notes and they can send photos and, and say voice flow allows you to send photos through your web chat widget, which I'm not sure why. Uh, and more so for things like WhatsApp deployments for your, your AI agents, um, being able to send voice notes to the customers and receive it from them and send pictures and get them back. Um, that's, I think a long way off and I'm looking forward to seeing how they allow us to build these different modalities into our systems that we sell. Even for my own platform Agentive, we now have this question of do we want to integrate audio and, and video and image and all these different things into our application and into our platform or do we want to just stick with text based? And I think this is a conversation many of these platforms are going to be having. Um, it's interesting to see how they play out. And moving on from that to something closely related is the lagging consumer behavior. Now we can have technology that moves ahead very fast and, and early adopters kind of catch up. If you've seen my, uh, my technology adoption curve video which I'll put up here somewhere. While technology can race ahead, the actual tastes and preferences and, and behaviors of the, the consumer populace take a lot longer to adjust. And e-commerce is an example of this where it took a long time for people to become comfortable with putting the credit card online. And now we do it, like the thought of putting a credit card and giving it to some, some random website was <laughs> ludicrous back in, if you go back far enough, it was a, a completely silly idea. And over time it took like decades for them to get to the point where it's like, okay, yeah, yeah, now now we all buy stuff online. This is the same sort of thing with, with AI, and I think we're gonna run into this GPT and, and ChatGPT may help with people getting used to speaking to these AI assistants and having conversations. Um, but I think there's still a considerable lag in the actual consumer behaviors where if we're trying to sell these solutions, do our end customers actually wanna be sending voice notes to WhatsApp? Do they wanna be sending pictures and, and giving videos to them? And personally, if historical precedents are anything to go off, I'm not betting on this thing moving too fast. Next, we have more of a technical one that I think could be an issue, which is the image and video difficulties that come along with building systems around uh, much more complex and varied inputs like text, image, and audio. Um, in this example here, you might have watched my prompt engineering video where I, I highlighted the difference between conversational prompting and single shot prompting. I'll put the video up there. If you haven't watched it, highly recommend. It's very important for you to know how to do prompt engineering and it's not your regular video. It's very, very different. We had some really good feedback on that. There's conversational prompting and then there's single shot prompting. For us as AI agencies, in many cases, we're working in the single shot range where we need to engineer the prompt and engineer the system to be 
uh, reliable and predictable and continue to give the same outputs over and over and over again um, so that they can actually be built into a company and, and operate as a, a artificial intelligence task that plugged into their systems. And doing that with text only proves to be difficult enough, as I'm sure some of you have found out. But now we introduce a whole nother layer of complexity of images and video. So imagine this example here of, a, of an email classification system where there's a user and they fill out a contact form, we get an email, then we use a, a pre-prompted GPT task on something like make.com to output a label. Now imagine this, instead of it being an email input, it was a video from a customer or it was a, was a photo of a, of a damaged good that they got from, a, from an e-commerce store. There's so much more complexity in that than, okay, I can understand text, but this is, okay, what's wrong with the product? From my own experience with vision models, they are nowhere near good enough to be able to be baked into these kind of systems and be able to reliably perform. So that's, that's another concern that I have um, for this new multimodal and omni-channel or omni-model future that they're going for. And finally, what might seem very concerning to some of you is this plateau in intelligence. Um, here's the model evaluation from OpenAI's blog post on the GPT-40 release. And you can see the pink bars here are GPT-40. And it's about this, it's about the same. And it's not a massive improvement. You know, it's, it's a very incremental look. We're just edging up above GPT-4 Turbo uh, in most of these categories. And yes, this is a text evaluation, I get that. And they're really focused on being uh, audio and video and things like this. To give them credit, if you go through these other tabs on the website, I will leave a link to the blog down below. Um, you can see that in, uh, in these audio and video uh, different tests, they are outperforming the, the prime models. And we are seeing much larger increases in capability and, and intelligence. But when it comes to the scores on the text evaluation, which is what we typically determine as the, the level of intelligence for getting questions right and, and reasoning, things like this, which is really crucial to the systems that we currently build, we're plateauing. Um, and we're seeing incremental improvements. And this opens up to a much broader discussion about the state of generative AI and, and where the future's gonna go. And here's a look at the multilingual performance. So you can see GPT-4.0 is better with different languages. Sure, but again, it looks fairly incremental. It's not like this massive leap forward in uh, intelligence. Um, this idea that generative AI may be plateauing or we're reaching some kind of upper, upper limit has been to some degree corroborated or, or confirmed by a re research paper. And while this may look crazy on screen, I'll, I'll explain it. Basically, um, they have found that as they continue to increase the size and the amount of data that they train models on, they're seeing a, a diminishing return, um, which may sound awful, but give me a second to explain. So I've actually, uh, a great video breaking this down is from, I think they're called Computer File. I'll leave a link down below. And as you can see on screen here, there's three scenarios of generative AI and, and artificial intelligence. And with these language models and the transform architecture, they have three different scenarios. Say the one is the most exciting, where as we continue to uh, say on these on these axes, sorry, uh, we have the number of examples in the training data set, and then we have the performance or the intelligence on the Y axis. And in the first case, if we continue to increase the number of examples in the training data set, we get this exponential curve, as you can see here, of it's just runaway general intelligence and things get so much smarter and we put in a little bit more data and it gets way smarter. And then there's a more balanced or conservative one, which is a, a, a linear relationship where more examples, more data equals better performance and, and greater intelligence. But what they are starting to see, as you can see from, from this graph here, is a potential uh, worst case, maybe not worst case, but not the greatest case outcome um, based off the evidence of this paper where we are seeing a flattening curve. And as we continue to increase the examples, it's flattening off and we're not getting any kind of meaningful increase in intelligence. This is a little summary from that research paper, which is there is a clear log linear trend for the models to get incrementally better at handling a concept, that concept needs to appear exponentially more times in the training data. This shows the models are very data inefficient, which may sound concerning to you as someone who's just bet their whole life on this AI space and continued advancements. Um, and I guess the question is, has generative AI peaked? Um, and I think this is an important one to ask. But personally, I'm betting on this being a temporary plateau where the architecture and the transformer that we currently use is kind of maxing out and, and we've pushed it as far as we can. We've got great capabilities. We have an awesome set of new technology to use and implement into businesses. Um, and we've just attracted the entire, every smart brain on the planet has, has flooded into this space as, as you are here watching this video, uh, interested in the space. And we have the greatest researchers and minds all going into it. Humans are not done with artificial intelligence by no, by any means. We're not just gonna go, oh, well, well, we've got diminishing returns, right? <laughs> I'm out like, okay, I guess we can't get any smarter than that. So it's, it's complete rubbish. So we're gonna continue to keep pushing. And just like the transformer architecture, blasted open the scene for us to be able to get to this point um, when GPT-3 released. 
We're gonna to continue to see people innovate and try to create smarter architectures that are more efficient on training with their data. So we could be looking at a, a little plateau, a nice little bit of room to catch our breath. And, and I honestly think that that is gonna be very, very good for the space as the, the AAA and the AI automation agency space as a whole. Because if, if the, the tech keep, kept taking off and it just got better and better and better and every six months we had a whole bunch of new stuff to try and adapt to, we don't ever get a chance to really catch our breath and solidify our solution. So this is, something that I've, I've been kind of excited for to some degree where I get questions on the channel which is oh but like what if what if the, like why why do they need our solutions why would they ever need to use us if if this thing's just going to get so good that suddenly they can type one word and then it just automates the whole business that that is a, a very low percentage outcome like in terms of probability and if this is anything to go by we're not going to get there anytime soon so we have a chance now to say, okay, yes, people have dropped out of the space. They've gone off, they've chased other, other shiny objects. We now have a chance to really work on our craft, really work on identifying these use cases and going into businesses and finding ways that AI can help them. And we get a, a nice runway now before things take off again to dial in our services, to get experience and to continue to push ourselves further and further away from the spectators who sit there and watch AI news to the people who actually take an action like you and I. So I hope they give you a little bit more clarity about what this update means for us as AI agency owners. I do not like being an AI news channel, but when there's big updates from OpenAI, um, it is worthwhile coming in here and hopefully giving you guys a bit of insight into what this means for us. If you have enjoyed the video, hit down below and leave a like. Um, subscribe to the channel if you're not already uh, for more content like this, teaching you how to make money and build businesses in the AI space. If you're interested in seeing what my life day to day is like here in Dubai as an AI agency owner, you can check out my recent video here um, showing you the raw reality of my life as an AI entrepreneur. But aside from that guys, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.